Hey everyone, it's Mark here. In this video, I'm going to talk about how Michael Burry has grappled with the looming prospect of inflation. And I'm going to go through Cyan Asset Management's most recent 13F filings to talk about what positions might be relevant in relation to inflation, which appears to be looming very near on the horizon. Now, I have a background in finance, I have a PhD in finance, I'm an angel investor and a quant, so I follow these things pretty closely. But if you think I've missed anything, or if you have any thoughts about this strategy, let me know that in the comments below. Okay, so effectively, there are two main limbs to the strategy as far as I can tell. The first one and the most important one appears to pertain to treasuries, and it appears that he has taken implicitly a short position in relation to treasuries. The second one, and I believe this to be the less important as it pertains to inflation, is there appears to have been a shift away from financials and more toward general consumer type companies and the like, which might benefit from or at least be less hurt by inflation. Now, this is important because sophisticated investors have already remarked that inflation is upon us. I, Warren Buffett has remarked this, Charlie Munger had agreed, same, had, same with Greg Abel at Berkshire Hathaway. It, it, it is not a price sensitive economy right now in the least. And uh, I don't know exactly how when it shows up in different price indices, but there's, there's more inflation going on than quite a bit more inflation going on than people would have anticipated of just six months ago or thereabouts. Yeah, and there's one very intelligent man who thinks it's dangerous. So it is something that investors need to grapple with. So let's go into his 13F filings to see exactly what is happening here. So here we have Cyan Asset Management's 13F filing report. This is given to us from Whale Wisdom. You could get this from the SEC itself, but it is going to be less nicely laid out. Here they're telling us top buys, top sells, 13F holdings, and the like. And also at the bottom here, we can see sector allocation over time. So what I first want to do is I want to look at the total holdings. And from the holdings, I'll go to that first limb. The first limb being the uh, treasury related aspect of it. Now, what you'll see here is it's sorted by market value, or we could sort it by percentage of portfolio, doesn't really matter, we're going to get the same basic idea. So if we sort here by percentage of portfolio, what we can see is we've got a couple of things. We've got as the largest holding right here, we've got a Tesla put, which I've talked about beforehand. This is not really pertaining to inflation. This is really pertaining to a bearish position on Tesla, which he'd been flagging for quite some time. Short version of it is, he appears to believe that Tesla was overvalued, hence the put option. And I'll get to put options more generally in just a second. The second one which is more relevant for us for inflation is this put on TLT. So what is TLT? Well, TLT is effectively a treasury related ETF. So TLT is going to basically give you an exposure to treasuries. That's pretty much what it is, an ETF on treasuries. I, I here, ET, ETF, iShares 20 year plus treasury bond ETF. What this means is that TLT is going to be giving you a positive exposure to treasuries. Think of it as being like giving you an exposure to government bonds, and in this case, 20 year government bonds. So that's what TLT effectively is. Now, that then begs the question of what exactly is it that Michael Burry is doing here? I.e., we have this put on TLT, but what exactly does that mean? So to understand what that means, we need to think about what a put option actually is. Now, granted, this could be somewhat laborious for me to go over it for you, but a put option basically enables you to benefit when a underlying asset price declines. So here in ETF, so when the stock price declines, the payoff from the put option is the strike price minus the, put, minus the spot price. So what happens with the put option is it gives you the right, but not the obligation to sell the underlying asset at a predetermined price at or up until a predetermined date, the exact date will depend on the nature of the option. So you've locked in the right, but not the obligation to sell. What this means is that if the asset price declines, you would want to exercise your option and sell using that predetermined price rather than selling in the market. So you're going to gain as long as the price starts to decline. So the option, the option rather, will be in the money if the spot price declines, will be out of the money if the spot price increases above the strike price. And we can see this somewhat diagrammatically. So here we can see the put option payoff. And once again, apologies if this is slightly laborious for you. But basically, like I said, 
It gives you the right, but not the obligation to sell the underlying security. So what we have here is what's called the strike price. So if the spot price, so the stock price is above the strike price, you would just go out and sell in the market. So in this case, your payoff is going to be zero from your option and your profit is going to be the uh, going to be the intrinsic value minus the option premium. As long as the stock price falls, you start making money and you make money because here you would exercise the option rather than exercising or selling in the market. So you go out and buy the asset in the market, then turn around and sell it using the option. So your profit here is going to be uh, X where X is the strike price minus S where S is the uh, stock price minus your put option premium. That's going to be your profit. So he's going to benefit as long as these treasuries are declining. So if he's benefiting when treasuries are declining, what does this really mean? Well, to think about this, we need to think about what drives treasuries. Now, treasuries are locked in. So when you've got a treasury here, you've locked it in at time zero. It's issued at par at the current yield to maturity. When yields start to go up, the price of existing treasuries goes down. The reason for that is they were paying a yield that was lower than what the market currently demands. As a result, the prices of those yields will go down because they're not offering you a high enough return for the risk that you are perceived to be taking. This is based on how bonds are priced using the basic bond pricing formula. So effectively here, as yields start to go up, treasuries start to go down. As a result, by taking a short position, effectively a put position here in treasuries, he's effectively going to profit when treasuries start to go down in price. This means he's going to profit when yields are increasing. This means that he's going to profit when inflation is going up. The reason for that is inflation, when inflation goes up, treasury yields also start to go up. As a result, his put option is going to enable him to profit from an increase in yields, which would represent an increase in inflation, which would then cause treasuries to decline in price. Now to see why this is important, let's have a look at what is happening to treasuries recently. So here I have a graph of the 10 year treasury yield. Uh, now, admittedly he was doing a put on 20 years, but I mean, the same basic logic applies really. Um, so what you've seen here is with these treasuries, they spiked up at 1.7% and they're now down at around 1.6%. So they are reasonably high. Now with this decline in yields, you might be thinking, well, why would you be taking a short position on treasuries? Because when yields are going down, treasuries are going to go up in price. Your existing treasuries will go up in price because they would be now be paying you a higher rate of return than what the market is demanding. Well, to see why this is actually useful, we should probably zoom out and see what has been happening over the longer term. Here I have it for the last month, but let's look at it for the past year. Now, when we go for the past year, what you will immediately notice is that treasury yields have been trending upwards. Now, if his expectation is that treasuries will keep going upwards, then his position makes sense because he'll be profiting when treasuries keep going upwards and treasury, or treasury yields sorry, keep going upwards and then treasury prices start to go down. So he's basically betting that the Fed is going to increase rates and he'd be profiting from this. And he'd be betting the Fed would increase rates to keep inflation under control. So does this make any sense? Well, it makes sense if you think the Fed will increase rates to keep inflation under control. It does not make sense if you think the Fed will not increase rates. Now, he patently does think the Fed will have to increase rates to keep inflation under control. He's already remarked about inflation, of course. The issue is whether he's perhaps a little bit more bullish than one would think. The reason I say that is the Federal Reserve has largely been talking about the idea that inflation is going to be short-lived and temporary and could be, in fact, due to blips. So, for example, we've got blips like shortages of various chips for a whole lot of computing things. We've got issues in relation to commodities where we would had iron ore spiking due in part to demand for iron ore, but also just due to general economy recovering from COVID situations. So basically there'd be a backlog of work that needed to be gotten on top of, natural disasters also causing some inflation. So that could be accounting for part of it. So if the Fed sees inflation is short lived, then the Fed would not increase rates. If the Fed sees inflation is picking back up and the economy overheating, then the Fed could potentially increase rates. I'd probably stand somewhere personally, a little bit in the middle. I'd regard inflation as potentially being a danger, but I'd regard it as necessary to identify precisely why inflation is arising and what exactly is causing it. And not overreacting when we see inflation increasing, but it mainly being a short-term blip 
due to other exogenous things that are going to sort of sort of not exist for that much longer. So that's the first major aspect of the inflation hedge here. The second aspect is more pertaining to sector allocation. Now, this is much less important to my mind than the Treasury put. The reason it's less important is the Treasury put directly gets at the impact of what inflation would have. We can go now to the sector allocation. So here we have Cyan Asset Management sector allocation. Now, I do not want to overstate this because when we've got a sector allocation, there's a couple of things that are in play. A, which industries you want to assign to, and also B, which individual so stocks rather you would prefer to invest in. And if you're going to be focusing on individual stocks, then the sector might be a secondary matter after you've selected which stocks you want to buy or which ones you want to sell. So it is important to not overstate sector allocation. However, we can draw some insights from sector allocation, not all of which are going to be related to inflation, but some of which will be. So let's have a look at what we've got here. So right here in this graph, we've got a sector allocation. The sector allocation telling us what portion of the portfolio is being assigned to each individual industry. We've got this for the quarters from quarter four 2015 up until the most recent one. So let's have a look at how this is being assigned here. So our first one, and probably the most populous in the portfolio, is, is in the energy sector, in this dark orange. The light orange, which was heretofore much larger, was consumer discretionary. So what this might imply, and again, not all of this would be pertaining to inflation, is that energy is generally going to be inflation agnostic. Of course, people always need electricity. So it can kind of adjust prices as inflation adjusts. And oftentimes, much like with utilities, energy pricing will be at least somewhat tied to inflation as contracts are renegotiated and the like. So energy does make some sense there. The reduction in consumer discretionary could make some sense when we also put it in the context of what he's doing with consumer staples. So we need to look at both of them in tandem, in my opinion anyway. So let's move on to consumer staples and discretionary at the moment. Now, what you'll notice is in the most recent allocation, consumer discretionary is basically listed as zero. Now, there's probably a pretty strong reason for that in that is taken some pretty heavy positions with some of the consumer discretionaries. So let's have a look at some of the asset allocations itself into individual assets. So if we have a look at the uh, percentage of shares held, so percentage of portfolio rather, so let's sort here. What you will see is the largest position right here is a Tesla put, and that's a put clearly. So it's effectively a negative, although it is he owns the instruments, but it is like a short type position and it's in consumer discretionary. So we do need to bear that one in mind. That could also account for part of this issue with sector allocations, because if there are short positions, that's clearly going to offset some long positions. So that's effectively what we're kind of seeing with consumer discretionary. Now with consumer staples, that potentially is the opposite end of the spectrum. Part of the reason for that, and that's right down here, and that has, if we just go in and zoom in on that one, that has increased a little bit quarter on quarter. Part of the reason for that, of course, could be that consumer discretionary can increase with inflation because people always need beef or milk or whatever it is, uh, and this can easily trend up with inflation. So it is a little bit more inflation agnostic than, say, consumer discretionary, particularly if he thinks that consumer discretionary things might be slightly overpriced at the moment. So that's what we're seeing in the consumer sector. The next thing we can look at is financials. Now with financials, that's in this dark green right here. It's subtly decreased quarter on quarter, although I don't want to overstate that. So it has subtly decreased quarter on quarter. Now, part of the reason for this is inflation can have mixed impacts for financial companies. Now, on the one hand, if you've issued a whole lot of floating rate mortgages, those floating rates will increase as treasury yields go up. So you're somewhat protected there. However, if the bulk of your book is fixed, i.e. fixed debt, and there's going to be a little bit more fixed debt in the US than say in Australia, then you're going to get a little bit hurt by inflation, much for the same reason as treasuries might be. That said, financials can adjust. So as interest rates go up, financials can start lending at that higher interest rate. 
So you're going to see swings and roundabouts when it comes to financials. And that could explain why it's remaining relatively stagnant in terms of the portfolio allocation here, at least in terms of percentage contribution. The next one, of course, is healthcare. Now, healthcare is right here in this light green. Uh, now, healthcare has increased quite a bit in terms of its sector allocation. Now, that could easily be reflecting the fact that healthcare is continually going to be important. To my mind, the aged care sector is going to be of increased and continued importance over time. Now, that probably would not drive this one blip quarter on quarter. However, healthcare is also going to be inflation protected because people always need their healthcare products. There are some issues outside the US in that outside the US, people tend to balk at healthcare price increases, but in the US, that seems to be less of a problem. So it does appear to be a little bit more inflation protected than some other sectors. The next one, which to my mind was slightly curious, is real estate. Now, real estate remains high in the sector allocation here. To my mind, that's curious because there are some asset bubbles, or at least what I would regard as potential asset bubbles, which would make a high allocation to real estate an interesting choice. Now, it has slightly decreased quarter on quarter, but it is something that is worth watching for. Perhaps he's of the mind that real estate is going to hold some degree of value and won't ultimately tank. And this is important whether or not you're holding developers or holding agents or whatever the case, or if you're just holding REITs. All of those are going to benefit more the more prices increase. So it is a curious decision to my mind. Now, we already talked about consumer staples in the light blue. What we can talk about now are the bottom two sectors. So this one in this, I guess, teal color is transport. That could potentially reflect an expectation uh, that transport could easily increase as COVID and the ramifications thereof start to subside. And that potentially is not an unreasonable hypothesis there that uh, it could start to get slightly better. Um, now, that's in terms of transport. Now, I want to be clear here, transport does not include Tesla. Tesla, as indicated, is consumer discretionary. So that's right here. There are some other quirks in relation to transport. So if we just go down to another one right down here, let's just sort this by alphabetical order in terms of stocks to give you an idea about some quirks in terms of how things are listed. So here we've got GOGL. Uh, which is Golden Ocean Group. Uh, Golden Ocean Group being a shipping company. Now, this is interesting because it's listed as energy right here. Now, clearly there is going to be some input from energy because energy shipping, right? Like oil and gas being shipped. But nevertheless, I'd probably put it more into transport. So we do need to bear in mind there's some weirdness in terms of some of the allocations, in my personal opinion, that is. In any case, uh, transport appears to have remained uh, quite strong within the portfolio allocation. Now, going back here, uh, we can also see at the very bottom and in our last one, uh, we have, where are we? At uh, the very bottom, utilities. Now, utilities, again, would be a decent one with inflation because utility pricing is oft times inflation plus a profit margin or something along those lines. So to some extent, it's kind of protected in an inflation protected manner. So you can sort of see why that is going to be the case. Now, the actual formula, for how utility prices are based, is going to depend uh, quite a bit on like the industry and the region. So I don't want to do a one size fits all statement about how energy prices are made, but it is the type of thing where you can easily see this being perhaps a little bit more insulated from inflation than some other sectors. So that's a bit of an overview about the sector allocation and to what extent it might uh, dovetail into inflation related issues. Okay, so there we are. I hope that gives you a bit of an idea about some of the strategies Michael Burry appears to be taking in relation to inflation. It appears that there are a couple of underlying strategies. Firstly, there's that put position in relation to the treasuries, uh, which would appear to benefit when yields increase and those treasury prices on existing treasuries start to go down. So that appears to be one strategy he's taken. Secondly, it would appear that some of the sector allocation might be playing into this. But again, I do not want to overstate this because many of the individual stocks and the decisions to buy individual stocks will be based on the merit of those stocks as opposed to blind sector allocation. And that makes a lot of sense because blind sector allocation is probably going to be a recipe to lose money. Rather, one does need to think about the intrinsic value of the individual stock. 
and ideally get a stock in a sector you think is going to do well in the particular market climate. And in any case, that's a bit of an overview about his portfolio and how I think it dovetails into inflation predictions. If you think I've missed anything, or if you have any other views about his portfolio, let me know those in the comments below. It would be interesting to hear your views as well. Otherwise, thanks a lot for tuning in, and it would be great if you liked the video and subscribed to the channel, and I hope to see you for future videos as well. Bye.